I want to start with a thought experiment. Suppose I told you that I'm imagining an activity that takes place between consenting adults, doesn't hurt anyone, and results in a great deal of pleasure for the people involved, and that's all you know about the activity that I'm imagining. Given that information, sounds pretty good. Suppose I fill in the picture a bit more and tell you that not only does it result in pleasure for the people involved, but it's an avenue of communication and a source of deep meaning in their lives. And again, that's all you know about the activity that I'm imagining. Given that information, it sounds great. Kind of thing we'd want to encourage. But of course, when I fill in the picture a bit more and tell you the adults in question are two men or two women, and the activity is some kind of sexual activity, suddenly people are not so keen on it anymore. In fact, not only would many people condemn it, some would call it a moral abomination. Consider the fact that right now there are thousands of people across the world having sex. It's kind of disconcerting when you think about it, especially when you realize you're sitting here listening to me. <laughs> some of those people are with partners of the same race and some of them are with partners of a different race. Some of them are with partners of the same age. Some of them are in what we call May-December relationships. Some of them have known each other a long time. Some of them met last night on the internet. Some of them are in loving, nurturing relationships. Some of them are in abusive relationships. Now, those facts all have varying moral significance. But when I tell you that some of these people are with partners of the same sex and some of these people are with partners of the other sex, that fact seems to take on a significance all its own. And the question I want to explore tonight is, why? What's morally wrong with homosexuality, if anything? And if nothing, what's all the fuss about? And the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to look at some of the most common arguments against homosexuality and subject them to philosophical scrutiny, which sounds fancier than it is. Really, we're just going to look at these arguments, see what they are, see if they work. Before I get to the arguments, there are a few preliminary things I want to get out of the way. We're talking about homosexuality tonight. What is that? A lot of people like to make a distinction between homosexual orientation and homosexual activity. Homosexual orientation, being attracted to people of the same sex. Homosexual activity, engaging in some kind of romantic activity with people of the same sex. Like many such distinctions, this one is both useful and problematic. It's useful in part because it reminds us that we all have feelings that we don't act upon, maybe shouldn't act upon. I'll give you an example. Sometimes I'm in line, and there's somebody in front of me with one of those Bluetooth earpieces on. And they're chattering and chattering, completely oblivious to the people behind them. And we're all waiting, and they keep chattering. And sometimes, when that happens, I fantasize for just a split second about pulling out a sword and chopping off their ear. <laughs> I don't act on that feeling. It's, you don't act on that feeling. You may have had similar feelings. I mean, we all have feelings we don't act upon, and that's part of being a grown-up. That's part of being a human being, you have self-restraint. Just because you have a feeling doesn't mean you ought to act on it. And this distinction reminds us of that. It's a problematic distinction because it oversimplifies. For one thing, it draws a very sharp contrast between feelings and activities when the contrast between those things is not always so sharp. Sometimes they're intimately connected. Sometimes who we are and what we do are profoundly connected and this distinction maybe makes us forget that a little bit. It's also problematic because it oversimplifies each of the elements involved, both sexual orientation and sexual activity. And let me say something about each of those elements. Let's start with activity. What do I mean when I say homosexual activity? Well, what do I mean when I say heterosexual activity? Intercourse? Sure. What about kissing? Sometimes. What about holding hands? What about going for a romantic walk with someone? What about making a nice dinner for someone? What about waiting outside someone's door because you have a crush on that person? Yeah, you know who you are. <laughs> Think about all of the activities that make up our romantic lives broadly understood. When we talk about heterosexuality, we talk about that wide range of activities. When we talk about homosexuality, we focus on the sex part of it. 
And that gives us the kind of picture like the bedroom is the only room in the homosexual person's house, or the most important part of our lives and relationships. And it's a false picture. This is not the only time we get this sort of false contrast. I mean, we say things. We say, you know, heterosexual people, we talk about relationships. Homosexual people, we talk about sex. We say, heterosexual people have lives. Homosexual people have lifestyles. I teach at a state university. I don't make enough money to have a lifestyle. <laughs> We say heterosexual people have a moral vision, homosexual people have an agenda. <laughs> the words we use to talk about these things really affect our way of thinking about them. Now, I'm going to focus on homosexual sex tonight because that's the part that bothers people. But I don't want you to get this kind of skewed picture that's the only part of homosexual activity or homosexual relationships or homosexual people's lives. What about the other side of this contrast? Sexual orientation. I have a certain sexual orientation. What is that? I'm attracted to people of a particular gender. That's true. I'm also attracted to people of a particular age range, body type, personality type, certain kinds of senses of humor. All of these things make up my sexual orientation broadly understood. But when we talk about sexual orientation, we focus very narrowly on the gender of people that you're attracted to, and then we divide everyone into these nice, neat categories. There are heterosexual people, and there are homosexual people. Then there are bisexual people, and they mess up our neat categories. <laughs> Everywhere I go, people say to me, I just don't understand bisexuality. Let me take a little time to explain it, because it's not a complicated concept, really. Some people are attracted to both men and women. That's it. <laughs> it doesn't mean they're attracted to everyone. That'd be exhausting. <laughs> doesn't mean they're confused. It doesn't mean that gender is not important to them. It doesn't mean any of those things. It just means it's not an overriding factor in what makes people attractive to them. And I mention this because many of the same problems faced by gay and lesbian people in our society are faced by bisexual people. Bisexual people are not half kicked out of the house for being bisexual or half fired from their jobs or half harassed for being bisexual. I'm going to be focusing on homosexuality tonight, but much of what I say can be applied with the appropriate changes to bisexuality. Finally, in the years I've been doing this, a number of people have made the comment, at least in the early years, I started doing this in, in Texas in the early 90s, and people said to me, you know, your approach seems so negative. You're always talking about the arguments against homosexuality. Why don't you ever give an argument in favor of homosexuality? And I said, you know, it's a good idea. So I want to start with a kind of preliminary argument in favor of homosexuality. Preliminary argument. There's a lot more to be said. But in a way, the preliminary argument is quite simple. Homosexual relationships make some people happy. When I say it makes people happy, I don't just mean that they're pleasurable, although that's part of it. But there's more to it than that. A homosexual relationship, like a heterosexual relationship, can be an important avenue of meaning and long-term fulfillment in people's lives. This is the kind of thing that we celebrate when we talk about heterosexuality. We celebrate it everywhere from great literature to romance novels to trashy shows on MTV. You know these shows? You can feel your brain cells dying as you watch some of these shows. You know the ones. But they have this point in common about finding a special someone, connecting with that person, expressing your feelings for that person in a way for which mere words would be inadequate. This is a wonderful, beautiful part of the human experience. If we're going to deny this to a whole group of people saying, you can't have that, that's wrong, we'd better have a darn good reason. So let's look at what some of those reasons might be. And the first reason I'm going to look at, the first argument, is the argument that homosexuality is wrong because the Bible condemns it. Now, when I say the Bible, I could be talking about a lot of different things. There are many different scriptural texts that different groups of people recognize as authoritative. Even if we focus on the so-called Judeo-Christian tradition, which is actually a melding of, of different traditions, there are arguments about which books should be included, which translations are authoritative, and so on. We could go through all of that. Let's put that aside. Suppose you know what I'm talking about when I talk about the Bible. And when we look to that Judeo-Christian Bible, we find some things that actually sound pretty negative with respect to same-sex relationships. 
The book of Leviticus says, man shall not lie with man as with woman. It is an abomination unto God. Of course, the book of Leviticus calls a number of other things abominations that we don't tend to pay attention to quite as often. The book of Leviticus says that eating shellfish is an abomination unto God. Shrimp cocktail? Not if you follow Leviticus. <laughs> the book of Leviticus says that wearing clothing of mixed fiber is an abomination unto God. Cotton polyester blends? Not if you follow Leviticus. <laughs> the book of Leviticus says that touching the carcass of a dead pig is an abomination unto God. Football? Not if you follow Leviticus. <laughs> they used to be made of pigskin. Stay with me. <laughs> and it's not just the book of Leviticus. And it's not just the Old Testament. As we look through the Bible, we find a number of things that seem, at best, morally problematic. St. Paul says, women must remain silent in the churches. Doesn't seem to me like good moral advice. The Bible suggests that those who divorce and remarry should be put to death. Why? Well, because the New Testament defines divorce as adultery. The Old Testament prescribes death for adultery. Again, this doesn't sound very good. The Bible suggests that slavery is morally acceptable. People don't believe me when I tell them this. I say, okay, I'll read to you. This is from Leviticus chapter 25, verses 44 to 46. You may buy male and female slaves from among the nations that are round about you. You may also buy from among the strangers who sojourn with you and their families that are with you who have been born in your land and they may be your property. You may bequeath them to your sons after you to inherit as a possession forever. Who says this according to the Bible? God says that according to the Bible. And yet we have a hard time imagining how an all-good, all-loving God could condone an institution like slavery. And it's not just the Old Testament either. St. Paul says in Ephesians, Slaves, be obedient to your earthly masters in fear and trembling, in singleness of heart, as you obey Christ. Again, you look at this and you say, well, what, what's a believer to do? One thing I think you can do is to say, maybe the Bible's wrong about certain things. This does not mean that God is wrong. Rather, maybe human beings have been wrong in discerning God's word. After all, we should not confuse complete faith in God with complete faith in our ability to discern God's voice. And in fact, any honest look of his at history should tell us that we should be wary of people who are too certain that they speak directly for God. But some people want to say, no, 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 the Bible is God's word. The Bible is infallible. The Bible contains no error. And I say, the Bible contains no error. What are you going to do with those slavery passages? And you know what the people say to me? They say, John, you are pulling those passages out of context. You can't just take passages out of the Bible and quote them as if they mean the same thing today as they did for the people at the time. They were, you can't just pull the passages out of context. <laughs> and I say, well, wait a second. If it's not okay to do that with the slavery passages, why is it okay to do that with the homosexuality passages? Because after all, the context surrounding same-sex relations was very different in biblical times than it is during our own day. And indeed, in the handful of places that the Bible talks about homosexuality, it's almost always in the context of a discussion of, of idolatry, because homosexuality was very much associated with certain pagan practices. If that's the kind of thing the biblical authors had in mind, if that's what they meant, then what they're talking about and what I'm talking about are very different things. And to use those passages that way would be to pull them out of context. Now, a few caveats and clarifications. First of all, I want to make it clear what I'm not saying here. I'm not saying, hey, the Bible's old, so forget about it, ignore it, just pick the parts you like. Okay. A lot of people do that on different sides of the debate. I don't think that's a, a very good way to proceed. Rather, I'm saying that if you're going to understand what the Bible means for us today, we have to understand that the biblical author's concerns and our concerns may be different, and that's relevant to our interpretation of the text. And the alternative to that is to commit ourselves to very strange views on women's roles, on slavery, and a host of other things. Second, having said that, I'm not convinced that any amount of context is going to help the slavery passages. I think when we look to those passages, we have to admit that the prejudices and limitations of the biblical authors crept into the text. 
And if they did that with respect to slavery, it could happen with respect to homosexuality. Finally, it seems to me that in many cases, not all, but in many cases, the Bible is not really the root of the objection here. What often happens is people have an objection to homosexuality, maybe for reasons they don't quite fully understand, and then they use the Bible and bring it in to back that up. Why do I think this? Well, let me tell you a story. Many years ago, I was briefly a graduate student at Notre Dame, which, as you know, is a major Catholic university. And at Notre Dame, we were told by the administration that we could not have a gay and lesbian group on campus because that would conflict with Catholic teaching. And over and over, the administration would say, you cannot have a gay and lesbian group that conflicts with Catholic teaching. We did have a Muslim student group on campus and a Jewish student group on campus. <laughs> Muslims and Jews both deny the divinity of Christ, which when I went to Catholic school was a very important part of Catholic teaching. <laughs> It wasn't really about Catholic teaching, I don't think, at least not in that. I think that you know, they had this objection and they pulled in Catholic teaching when it was convenient. So what is it really about? Well, we need to look to some of the non-religious or secular arguments against homosexuality, and we especially need to do that if we are genuinely committed to living in a society that embraces freedom of religion. So what are some of those non-religious arguments against homosexuality? Well, the second argument I'm going to look at tonight, the first non-religious argument, is the argument that homosexuality is wrong because it's not universalizable. That's not a word you get to use every day. What does that mean? I first heard this argument back in, in 92. I gave an early version of this lecture at St. John's University in New York, where I had previously done my undergraduate work. And there was a priest, Father Pryor, who wrote to the school paper. He was very upset that I had been invited to give this lecture, and he wrote this long letter to the school paper and in his letter to the school paper, one of the things he said was, of course homosexuality is bad for society. If everyone were homosexual, there would be no society. And I call this the universalizability argument. If everyone were this way, if we universalize the activity, that would be bad, therefore the activity is bad. Now, I disagreed with a lot of what Father Pryor said in his letter, but I thought it was nice that he took the time to write to the school paper. And I said, you know what? I'm gonna write to the school paper too. So I did, I wrote an open letter to Father Pryor. It said, Dear Father Pryor, if everyone were a Roman Catholic priest, there'd be no society either. <laughs> Sincerely, John Corvino. Now, <laughs> what's the problem with this argument? Um, a few problems. One, Father Pryor seems to assume that just because society needs some people to procreate, that everyone is obligated to procreate. But of course, that doesn't follow. And society needs some people to be doctors, doesn't mean everyone's obligated to be a doctor. Society needs some people to be sanitation workers, doesn't follow that everyone is obligated. And yeah, we need some people to procreate, but it doesn't follow that everyone is obligated, as Father Pryor surely recognized. People have pointed out to me, yeah, well, some Catholic priests actually do have children. Fine. The point is, the argument applies equally well to celibacy. But let's suppose we were to grant this premise, this premise that everyone is obligated to procreate. Even that would not be an argument against homosexuality. At best, it would be an argument against exclusive homosexuality. I mean, homosexuality doesn't prevent a person from procreating any more than you're sitting here listening to this lecture prevents you from procreating. I mean, nobody's procreating right now, as far as I can tell. <laughs> the lights are kind of bright. I can't really see to the back. But it's just a non-procreative activity. And so Father Pryor's argument would not apply to gay and lesbian people who had children through prior relationships or artificial insemination, or if we take procreation broadly, through adoption. So we need a better argument to cover those things. So I'm going to turn to the third argument I'm going to look at, the argument that homosexuality is wrong because it's harmful. And this is not just one argument, of course. This is a whole host of arguments. Throughout history, Gay and lesbian people have been blamed for all kinds of disasters. Earthquakes, plagues, famines, Liza Minnelli. I... <laughs> we were partly responsible for that one, actually. You got to accept blame where it's due. Um, and it, you know, even today, we hear all kinds of crazy claims about homosexuality being associated with disease and, 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 and suicide rates and pedophilia and all kinds of social ills. 
When you listen to these claims, you've got to ask a couple of questions. One question is, are they true? Another question is, and how would we know this? It seems one way we might know is by talking to gay and lesbian people, because we know something about our own lives. But a lot of people say, no, 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 can't trust them, they're biased. <laughs> okay, so how do we find out about gay and lesbian people's lives? Well, we could look to statistics. But there's a problem with doing this, and it's not just the usual problem that, well, sometimes it seems like you can find a statistical study to, to back up any claim you want. There are better and worse statistical studies, to be sure. The problem is, that in order to make any kind of accurate comparison between gay and lesbian people on the one hand and straight people on the other, you need some way of separating the two. How do we do this? We ask people, are you gay or straight? I mean, you can't just check behind people's ears, you've got to ask them. And in a society that stigmatizes homosexuality, some people are not comfortable answering that question which makes it very difficult sometimes to get accurate samples for research on gay and lesbian people versus everyone else. Now, for many of these claims, we don't have to settle the statistical arguments in order to address the arguments. Part of the reason for this is that correlation is not the same thing as cause. How many of you have heard this before, maybe in class? Okay, just because two things go together, it doesn't mean that one causes the other. I usually illustrate this with the old story of the scientific drunk. Scientific drunk wants to know why he gets hangovers, so he starts keeping a journal. And he writes in his journal, Monday night, scotch and soda. Tuesday morning, hangover. Tuesday night, gin and soda. Wednesday morning, hangover. Wednesday night, vodka and soda. Thursday morning, hangover. And then he looks back at the journal and says, aha, soda causes hangovers. <laughs> I think that when we say homosexuality is responsible for all these problems, we might be looking at the soda. So what's the alcohol? Well, at least part of the alcohol seems to be society's treatment of gay and lesbian people, which might make it stand to reason that life is more difficult if you're a gay or lesbian person, and you might be more likely to exhibit certain problems as a result of that. In fact, there's something here that I call the argument of the bully. Bully on the playground knocks down another kid, kid falls down and starts crying. Teacher says, why did you hit the kid? Bully says, I hit him because he's crying and that bothers me. Teacher says, but he's crying because you hit him. Bully says, yeah, and if he keeps crying, I'm gonna hit him again. <laughs> now what's the problem with the bully's argument? The bully tries to justify what he does on the grounds that he doesn't like the effect of what he does. Now imagine somebody like, oh, I don't know, Pat Robertson. <laughs> Pat Robertson says, homosexual people lead miserable, unhappy lives, and I want to say, and why do you think that might be? Could it have anything to do with the kinds of things that you say about gay and lesbian people? Could it have anything to do with the kinds of positions you take? I mean, that might stand to reason that gay and lesbian people's lives are a little bit more difficult. Now you might say, okay, well that might work for some of the alleged problems, but not all of them. What about AIDS? Doesn't homosexuality cause AIDS? Um, no. <laughs> virus causes AIDS, and that virus can be passed along by homosexual activity, by heterosexual activity, by some activities that are not sexual at all. Consider the fact that from the standpoint of AIDS risk, it is infinitely more risky for me to have sex with an HIV positive woman than with an HIV negative man. Why? because it's the virus that causes AIDS, not the sex. And if the virus isn't present, two men can have sex for days on end without worrying about AIDS. <laughs> Fatigue, yes. AIDS, no. <laughs> and furthermore, if AIDS risk were somehow supposed to be the barometer of morality, lesbians would be the most moral people in the world. Because from the standpoint of AIDS risk, lesbian sex is the way to go. I see some of you are very risk averse in this audience. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Surgeon General recommends lesbianism. Okay, it's probably not going to happen, but <laughs> if we're talking about AIDS risk, I mean, this is, there are just too many gaps in this argument. The, the argument seems to assume all homosexual sex is risky, all risky activity is immoral, therefore all homosexual sex is immoral. That argument falls apart in two places, the first premise and the second premise. They're both false as written. Some homosexual sex is risky, some is not. Some heterosexual sex is risky. Some activities that are not sexual at all are risky. 
Some risky activities are immoral, some aren't. There are just too many gaps here. Now, in the early days of my lecture, when I used to talk about risk, that was all I would say. But people would sometimes try to ask me a question during the Q&A period. And I say try to ask me a question because it would often come out in a kind of garbled, uncomfortable way. And it took me a while to figure out what was going on. It, it would go something like this. They'd say, yeah, but isn't it risky because, you know, um, uh, when two men, um, you know, and it's risky because uh, the parts don't fit. And, um, and the, the parts don't fit because uh, when two men um, and the, the, the parts and and they go on and on and on, <laughs> doing this for a while. And finally, I would interrupt them and say, excuse me, are you trying to ask me about anal sex? Oh my god, he said anal sex in Texas. Arrest him. <laughs> I mean, it was a bad scene. But in fact, they were trying to ask me about anal sex. And I recognized that there was an interesting phenomenon that going on. When people would think about homosexuality, they would think about male homosexuality. When they would think about male homosexuality, they would think about anal sex. When they would think about anal sex, they had this argument in their mind that the parts don't fit. And I realized that if I was going to address people's actual concerns, I would have to address this argument. So I actually have two responses to this argument. First response, yes, they do. <laughs> How do I know? Um, well, because if they didn't, people would try it, it wouldn't work, and they'd go do something else. <laughs> I mean, what's that scenario going to look like? Oh my god, the parts don't fit. What are we going to do? I don't know. Do you want to go bowling? Sure, this isn't working. <laughs> I would actually have people during the Q&A portion of my program, I'm not making this up, they would say, well, of course it's wrong because And I want to say, if you're doing it this way, you're doing it wrong. What do you want me to tell you? <laughs> I mean, gay people aren't stupid. We don't say, oh my god, the parts don't fit. What are we going to do? <laughs> I began to understand why people always focus on male homosexuality, right? What's lesbianism going to look like? <laughs> At this point, we don't have an argument anymore. We have a panic, right? a second somewhat more serious response to the parts don't fit argument, which is this. Suppose you have an argument against a particular sexual practice, say anal sex. What do you have? You've got an argument against that practice, which is not tantamount to an argument against homosexuality, because not all homosexual people engage in anal sex. As I mentioned, there are many different experiences. Not only homosexual people engage in anal sex. This point also surprises some of my audiences. There's this great story about Strom Thurmond. <laughs> well, people always laugh when I say Strom. You remember Strom Thurmond? Strom Thurmond was the senator from South Carolina. He had been a segregationist many years ago. Then he ended up being in the Senate. He was there until he was like 116 years old or something. They were like dust him off and wheel him out. It's, it's kind of like weekend at Bernie's at the Capitol. <laughs> senator Thurmond, how do you feel about gay marriage? You could actually see the wires on C-SPAN. I'm not kidding. So, but there was this great story about Strom Thurmond. They were talking about sodomy laws. Now, many of you don't realize that before the Supreme Court struck down sodomy laws in 2003 in Lawrence versus Texas, that is, laws against sodomy, the dozen odd states that had such laws um, generally applied them to both anal sex and oral sex. A lot of people didn't realize they applied to oral sex. And about half of those states made the laws apply both to homosexual sodomy and heterosexual sodomy. So there were these laws on the books against heterosexual oral sex and as well as heterosexual anal sex and things like this. And this got brought up in this congressional debate. It's like, you know, these laws, I mean, heterosexual people do these things too. And Strom Thurmond actually stood up, which is no small feat. He stood up and said, no, they don't. <laughs> and suddenly I understood why that man was so cranky. <laughs> I don't want you to lose the serious point embedded in all of this, which is the following. When we're talking about 
homosexual activity, we are talking about a wide range of experiences, often the very same kinds of experiences that heterosexual people have sexually. And to try to define people in terms of one particular sexual act is such a reductionistic picture of people's experience, and it really gives us a false view. I've been talking about arguments that suggest that homosexuality is wrong because it's harmful to the people who engage in gay and lesbian relationships. But sometimes people say that homosexuality is wrong not because of what it does to gay and lesbian people, but because of what it does to the larger society. And we hear lots of claims about this. Homosexuality is a threat to the moral fabric of our country. It's a threat to the nation's infrastructure. I must admit I find some of these a little bizarre. How does what I do in bed threaten the nation's infrastructure? I might think I'm powerful in bed, but whoa, that's a crazy claim. <laughs> nation's infrastructure better watch out tonight, baby. But I just said to you, it's not just about what people do in bed, right? I'm being facetious there. I mean, but in what ways is this a threat to society? And there are all different kinds of arguments around this. I want to focus on two. I want to look at the argument that says that it's a threat to children, and then I want to look at the more general argument that says that it's a threat to marriage and the family. The argument that says that homosexuality is a threat to children could mean a number of different things. One thing it might mean is that as homosexuality becomes more visible, children will be more likely to grow up gay and lesbian. Now, first of all, there's absolutely no evidence for this. But even so, the argument is entirely circular. You can't argue that something is bad because if we allow it, other people will do it, because that still doesn't explain why that's bad. It's like saying, well, if we let people play golf, more people will want to play golf. OK, but why is that bad? OK, so that the argument doesn't get us anywhere. So then there's the other version of the argument that says it's a threat to children because homosexual people, and particularly gay men, are more likely to be pedophiles. Now again, the evidence does not bear this out. This claim is just false. But also I want you to think about this. Whenever a heterosexual person does something terrible, molests a child, rapes a woman, commits some horrible crime, we don't think of this as reflecting on all heterosexual people. Why then, when we read in the paper about a man molesting a boy, does this somehow become a fact about all gay people? Look, if you want to fight child abuse, I am right there with you. Child abuse is a horrible thing. But let's not confuse that with consensual adult relationships. Because to confuse those two things not only slanders innocent people, it also directs our attention away from the real threats to children, and that's a serious moral concern. So then people sometimes move away from the children argument a little bit and say, yes, but this is a threat to the family. I go around the country debating same-sex marriage. I've heard this argument many times. And I must admit to you, there's a part of it that I just don't quite get. Do we think that if we support gay and lesbian people in their relationships, that heterosexual people will stop having relationships and all go gay? <laughs> this seems implausible. The usual response to a gay person is not, Hey, no fair. How come he gets to be gay and I don't? <laughs> Heterosexual people will continue to have relationships, and that's a good thing, and we can support that while recognizing that it's not for everyone. In fact, I want to take this a step further. I want to say, not only does this argument scapegoat gay people and, and make that sort of mistake, it actually is a greater threat to the family than what it's trying to fight. Let me tell you another story. Many years ago when I lived in New York, there was a guy, Joe, he had a wife and several small kids and they went to my church. And one night I saw Joe out at a gay bar. And at first I wasn't even sure it was him because it, you know, it's like, how could it's Joe, he's got a wife and kids. And, but every time I look over at him, he'd do this. It's like, it's kind of conspicuous in a gay bar. So I, I went over to him and I tapped him on the shoulder. I said, Joe, what are you doing here? And Joe, who was about 10 years older than I am, explained to me that when he was growing up, being gay was just not an option. And he felt a lot of pressure to do the right thing, which for him meant marrying and having children. But it wasn't really working for him, and so he was living this double life. Now, I don't want to condone what he's doing there. I think that that's a terrible thing. On the other hand, I've never walked in his shoes. I don't know the kinds of struggles he went through. I don't really know enough details of the situation to make any kind of real informed commentary on the specific situation. But I do want to say this. 
We would have many fewer such difficult cases if we would simply recognize that heterosexual marriage is not necessarily right for everyone. And we don't do anybody any favors by pressuring them into situations that they're not suited for. Don't do gay people any favors. Don't do their spouses any favors. Don't do their kids any favors. OK, I want to move to the fourth and final argument that I'm going to look at this evening, the argument that homosexuality is wrong because it's unnatural. Now, this could mean a lot of different things. What is unnatural? I mean, clothing is unnatural in some sense. Buildings are unnatural in some sense. But we're not doing this naked and outside. Be thankful. So what do we mean when we say that homosexuality is unnatural? And also, why does that matter? Right? You know, unnatural, so what? So we need to specify some morally relevant sense of unnatural. Let me look at a few different things that people might mean when they say this. One thing they might mean is that most people don't do that. It's statistically abnormal. Well, that's true. Most people don't engage in homosexual relationships. Then again, most people don't play the mandolin, most people don't pilot planes, most people don't read Sanskrit. I mean, the fact that most people don't do something doesn't make it wrong. So that doesn't seem to be morally relevant. Well, what else might we mean? We might mean animals don't do that. There was a legislator when I lived in Texas, Warren Chisholm, who used to love this argument. He said, homosexuality is unnatural. Animals don't do that. Since when did animals start providing us with our moral standards, <laughs> particularly in the area of sex? I mean, think about this. Okay, animals don't become state legislators either. Can we lock Warren Chisholm up now? But beyond that, I mean, think about the premise behind this claim. I want to make you a promise. And I've made this promise to hundreds of audiences, so I've got to follow through on this if it ever happens. If I ever encounter Warren Chisholm in public, I'm going to get down on the ground and start humping his leg. <laughs> Just to drive home the point that animals do not provide us with our moral standards. And even if they did, well, then homosexuality wouldn't be a problem. Because not only do animals engage in homosexual sex, some actually form homosexual pair bonds. And people are always sending me clips about this kind of thing. You read the stuff in the paper, gay penguins in Central Park. I'm not making this up. Lesbian seagulls, but they got like short haircuts and Birkenstocks. I mean, what does that mean? <laughs> I mean, it's all very fascinating scientifically, but it's not going to answer the moral argument for us. You know what other scientific debate is not going to answer the moral argument for us? That whole nature nurture debate. You know what I'm talking about? Back when I started doing this, there was a lot of research going on about the hypothalamus of the brain and so on, and we used to hear this argument. And it seemed right away that there were two camps that formed. One side says, I was born this way, therefore it's natural, therefore it's OK. And the other side says, no, it's a choice, therefore it's unnatural, therefore it's wrong. I think those are both really lousy arguments, both of them. Let's take each one. I was born this way, therefore it's natural, therefore it's OK. Well, first of all, I don't really remember the way the world was when I was born. And Neither do you. I mean, the best you can say is, I've had these feelings as long as I can remember. I mean, you can't just by some act of introspection see your own genetic makeup. You've had these feelings for a long time. OK. But just because you've had feelings for a long time, it doesn't mean that you ought to act on them. I might have had violent feelings for as long as I can remember. But if I start hitting the people in the front row, you're not going to say, he was born that way. It's OK. <laughs> we don't judge the moral status of an activity by looking at the cause or origin of the disposition to that activity. On the other hand, there's the side that says, no, it's a choice, therefore it's unnatural, therefore it's wrong. Well, what do they mean when they say, it's a choice? This is one of those places where the orientation activity distinction actually comes in handy. They might mean that homosexual orientation is a choice, having those feelings. And if that's what they mean, that just seems false. How many of you choose your sexual feelings? Ask yourself whether you have ever been attracted to somebody that you wish you were not attracted to. <laughs> Maybe the person was already involved with somebody else. Maybe you were already involved with somebody else. Maybe the person just couldn't stand you. We've 
all had these kinds of experiences where we, you know, we had these feelings, we wish we could get rid of them, we can't, or the other side sometimes happens where we don't really have the feelings and we wish we could, you know, so-and-so is so nice, we have great conversations, but the spark's just not there. I mean, we don't have that kind of direct control over our feelings. But if we don't have that kind of direct control over our feelings for particular individuals, why would anyone think that we would have that sort of control over our feelings toward men in general or women in general? And why would anyone choose to be gay in a society that stigmatizes homosexuality? It just doesn't stand to reason. So then, the other possibility when they say it's a choice is that they mean the activity is chosen. And if that's what they mean, there's only one appropriate response. Duh, yeah. It's a technical philosophical term, you can write that down. Yeah, the activity is chosen. You don't just sort of wake up and find yourself, oh, I'm living with this person, how interesting. No, you make choices. But that doesn't say anything about whether it's a good choice or a bad choice, a natural choice or an unnatural choice in the relevant sense. Think of this by way of analogy. I am probably naturally right-handed in the sense that I've just been discussing. I've always written with my right hand. Everyone in my family writes right-handed. But if I were to pick up a pen and start writing with my left hand, you wouldn't say, unnatural, sinner. There was a time in history when people would have said that. People were burned at the stake for writing with their left hand. We think that's crazy, but it has nothing to do with whether left-handedness is something genetically determined or something learned in early childhood or something that I just do for some reason because I think it might be fulfilling to me. The scientific debates are not going to settle the moral debates. So what else might we mean when we talk about unnatural? Well, maybe people are grasping at this kind of natural law tradition that goes back to Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas. The idea is something like the following. All of our organs have certain natural purposes. Our eyes are for seeing, our ears are for hearing, our genitals are for procreating. And to use your organ for some purpose other than its natural purpose is unnatural and therefore wrong. Now, there are a number of problems with this argument. A lot of our organs have multiple purposes. I can use my mouth for talking, for singing, for breathing, for licking stands, for blowing bubbles, for kissing a woman, or for kissing a man. And it seems very arbitrary to say that all of those are natural except the last one. And if you say, well, okay, you know, using it to lick stamps, that's not natural, but it's okay, well, then we don't have a morally relevant sense of unnatural. Now, what about the sexual organs? Obviously, one purpose of the sexual organs is procreation. Nobody denies basic biological facts here. But is that the only legitimate purpose? Heterosexual people often have sex even if they don't want children, don't want children yet, don't want any more children, or can't have children. Why? Because there are other purposes for sex. Building and expressing a kind of intimacy and connection and relationship. Showing affection for a person. Even the Roman Catholic Church, which is by no means a permissive organization, <laughs> will allow sterile heterosexual couples to marry and have sex, and will allow pregnant women to have sex with their husbands, even though further procreation can't result. Why? Because they recognize that there are these other dimensions of sex, this unitive dimension of sex. But if it's okay for heterosexual people to pursue that in the absence of procreation, why is it not okay for homosexual people to do this? I think one of the best ways to show this is by analogy to certain other uh, organs of the body. Take the digestive organs. What's the purpose of the di digestive organs? Nutrition and hydration. So it seems that any time you eat or drink something, it should be to bring nutrition or hydration to the body. You've been drinking something. Can I borrow that? This is the audience participation version, <laughs> portion of the program. It's Diet Coke. Diet Coke contains less than 2% of the following. There's no nutrition in Diet Coke. Why would you drink it? Just for the taste of it? <laughs> presumably, presumably you would drink it for hydration because it brings fluid into your body, yes? No, because Diet Coke contains caffeine. Caffeine actually functions as a diuretic. It removes fluid from your body. This is why you're not supposed to drink caffeinated drinks while you're engaging in sports. It's why you pee a lot after you drink caffeinated drinks. And yet we all know that the purpose of eating and drinking is nutrition and hydration. That's the purpose of the digestive organs. Get this away from me, pervert. 
Oh, sure. You laugh now, but the next thing you know, Diet Coke drinkers will want to teach in our schools and parade their sin in the streets. You're laughing, and that's good because it means you follow me. This is what we commit ourselves to when we insist that our organs have a natural purpose, and to use them for any other purpose is unnatural and therefore wrong. Frankly, I think that when people say that homosexuality is unnatural, it's really kind of a fancy, dressed up way of saying, it's gross. It bothers me. It's icky. And I have no doubt that a lot of people feel that way about homosexuality. Maybe you're one of those people. And that's okay. A lot of us have feelings. A lot of things might gross you out. You might think that having reptiles as pets is gross. You might think that eating broccoli is gross. You might think that cleaning the bathroom is gross. You know, here at Wayne State University, where we're doing this lecture tonight, we have one of the largest mortuary science programs in the Midwest. And many of my students are in the mortuary science program. They take ethics class. They touch dead people on a regular basis. I think that's disgusting. <laughs> they hand their papers in to me. I'm like, ooh. <laughs> but the fact that it grosses me out, in fact, will probably gross most of us out, doesn't make it wrong. At best, that gives us grounds for an aesthetic judgment, not a moral judgment. OK, where are we? I have looked at some of the most common arguments against homosexuality and explained to you why I think they don't work. I want to conclude tonight by talking about what the real problem is. And I should say by talking about what part of the real problem is, because I don't think there's any simple problem or simple explanation here. I think it's complex. But I think part of it goes back to something I said a moment ago about it making people uncomfortable, it grossing people out. You know. We are often uncomfortable in the face of things that are unfamiliar. And that's especially true when we're talking about sex. I want you to think back to the first time you ever heard about sex. I remember when my parents gave me this book, Where Do Babies Come From? It's about two years ago. And <laughs> I learned fast. Seriously, I was a child. My parents gave me this book, Where Do Babies Come From? And I'm reading through, you know, two people who love each other very much, because apparently that's key to the whole process. I thought if I loved my mother too much, I'd make her pregnant. Then she became pregnant with my sister. I was kind of freaked out by that. <laughs> but I remember as I'm going through this book, getting to this page and going, you're supposed to put what, where, and do what with it? <laughs> and it wasn't just because I was a little gay kid. Sex is weird. I mean, think about it. Sex is Two people, they get naked, they rub up and down, they exchange bodily fluids. And, and then you try, and you're like, oh, I get it now. But in the abstract, sex is kind of weird. And I think when it comes to homosexuality, a lot of people never get past that whole, that's just weird reaction. And then they translate that, that's just weird reaction into, that's wrong. So if that's the problem, or at least part of the problem, what's the solution? Am I going to suggest you all go out and try it? Um, no. That would be interesting, but no. <laughs> I think a big part of the solution is for straight people to actually get to know gay and lesbian people, because only then do we come to realize that we have many of the same hopes and dreams, fears and challenges as everyone else. And that sounds very simple, but it's not easy. It's not easy because it gives us all a responsibility, kind of homework assignment, if you will. It gives a responsibility to straight people because it means you've got to get outside of your comfort zones a little bit in talking to gay, lesbian, and bisexual people. And straight people say to me, oh, no, I'm cool with the gay thing. I used to watch Will and Grace. <laughs> yeah, great. That's not just what I'm talking about, though. I'm talking about real life flesh and blood people. But that, of course, puts a responsibility on those of us who are gay, lesbian, bisexual, because it means that in order to do that kind of education by example, we have to be out of the closet. When I say out of the closet, it's like, oh, I go to the bar on the weekend. That's nice. But I mean just being honest about who we are. And that's not easy to do. In fact, sometimes it's not safe to do. Maybe you're not at a point where you can do that. But it's so important. It's important because it puts a face on the issue. Now, a lot of people at this point will say to me, mm, 
you had me part of the way, but now here you go about being all open about it now, and that's what I don't get. A couple days ago, I got an email. It was actually a very nice email. The, person, the title of the email was actually looking to understand, and the person was really genuinely, I think, trying to understand something about homosexuality, and, and he or she wrote, I don't remember if it was male or female, but the person wrote, you know, I don't understand if it... If you're okay with it, why do you have to be open about it? Why does everybody have to know? I don't understand why gay people have to be so open about it. And I've heard this question before. First person I ever heard this question from was my mother. Back when I came out to my parents many years ago, we used to have long discussions. And I remember one of these discussions with my discussions, arguments, whatever you want to call them. <laughs> we didn't throw things or anything, but it was, it was lively. During one of these discussions, my mother said, I just do not understand why you have to be so open about your sexuality. Your father and I are not open about our sexuality. <laughs> I want you to think about that sentence. Your father and I are not open about our sexuality. Not only is the person who utters that sentence openly heterosexual, she's open about having had sex at least once. <laughs> Heterosexual people do this all the time. They talk about their wives and their husbands, their boyfriends and their girlfriends, people they have crushes on, perfectly normal. We do the exact same thing and we're flaunting it. We're making an issue out of it. And that's a double standard and it's not fair. And I don't mean to pick on my mother here because over the years things have changed quite a bit. She's grown, both of my parents on this issue have been wonderful. A few years ago, I was home for Christmas with my partner, and my parents took us to this restaurant that they go to all the time. Uh, and so they know all the waiters and waitresses by name. And at one point, we're sitting there eating, and my mother sees a waitress walk by, and she says, Oh, Jane, come over here. I want you to meet my son John and his partner Mark. I nearly spit my food clear across the table when she said, Who are you, and what have you done with my mother? It, it was such a powerful moment. It was a powerful moment in part because of what it said to me, which was, you know what, we're not going to treat this like a dirty little secret anymore, because there's no reason to. In the simple act of saying, his partner Mark, not his friend, not his roommate, I mean, you can hear the quote marks around the words, this is John's roommate, his partner. That simple act of calling things by their right names, it shattered a taboo, and that was beautiful, and that was important. But it wasn't just important because of what it said to us at the table that day, or what it did for us at the table. It's also important for those who come after us. You know, one of the interesting things about gay and lesbian people as a minority group is that, in a sense, our children are not born unto us. And what I mean is this. Black people generally have black children. Jewish people generally have Jewish children. Any kind of people can have gay or lesbian children. Sometimes, rabidly anti-gay people have gay or lesbian <laughs> children. We can't protect them from a hostile world the way other minority groups can. We can't necessarily give them the benefit of our experience the way other groups can. And I feel for these kids, partly because I was there and I know what it's like, and partly because they're, in a sense, they're our kids. So what do we do for them? Well, one thing we can do is we can educate their parents. And you know, that day when my mother said, my son John and his partner Mark, someday that waitress may have a lesbian daughter or a gay son, and she may remember back and say, hey, you know what? The Corvinos had a gay son, and they went out to dinner with him and his partner, and they seemed to be okay with that. And that may seem so simple, but it's powerful. Sometimes it can make all the difference. But we're only going to have things like that if we have moral courage. And I mean it when I say moral courage. And this is a very important point. One of the biggest misconceptions about the work that I do is that people think that I'm out to attack morality, that I'm out to espouse some kind of moral relativism where I say, just do whatever you feel, it doesn't matter, or that I'm telling people, morality is a private matter, keep it to yourself, don't judge other people, I'm not about the moral judgments. People think this about me. Nothing could be further from the truth. So much of what I've said tonight is based upon my moral convictions. Convictions about fairness. Convictions about justice. I think the way gay and lesbian people are treated in our society is wrong. Not just irrational, but morally wrong. 
I think there's something perverted about the fact that we hate people because of whom they love. We do violence against people because of the affection that exists in their lives. And the effects of that treatment are a far greater moral tragedy than sex between consenting adults could ever be. And I'm not just talking about the obvious cases, a gay bashing, murder of Matthew Shepard. You don't need me to tell you that that's wrong. I'm talking about all the people living in silence and in fear, all of the wasted talent and energy that goes to building up walls. Why? Because somebody loves in a different way than other people do. That's terrible, and I want it to stop, but that takes moral conviction. You see, morality has a point. It's about enabling us to flourish as human beings in a society where other people are trying to do the same thing. And that's everybody's concern. Conservative or liberal, red state or blue state, all of us have a responsibility to stand up for morality. So let me make myself very clear. I am not asking you to stop making moral judgments or to keep your judgments to yourself. I'm all about the moral judgments. I'm asking you to make sure you have reasons for the moral judgments that you make. I'm asking you to put yourself in people's shoes before you judge them. And I'm asking you to judge people, not on whom they love, but on whether they love. That's my moral vision. That's my agenda. And I thank you for listening so patiently to it tonight. You've been a great audience. Thank you very much.